we're up to page, I believe this is 78 of uh, Civilization or Chaos. And uh, I'll just overlap a couple paragraphs. It should always be remembered that there is no difference in the consciousness of an avatar and a sadhguru, nor in the perfection of an avatar and a sadhguru. Both are one with God. Both experience infinite power, knowledge, and bliss, and both use these three aspects of Satchit Anand for the universe. The difference is in the actual scope of their working. The Sadguru works for a selected few in a chosen way and for the universe in a general way. But the avatar works for the selected few in a general way and for the universe in a chosen way. Mm -hmm. Thus, although both work for the universe and the field of their working is not limited, the scope of ways of their working is different. It should be emphasized that these differences exist only for the uninitiated. They do not exist for the God-realized persons themselves, who are not only one with each other, but one with all life and existence. So far as the fundamental characteristics of consciousness and the nature of the work in creation go, the avatar is like all sadgurus. The sadgurus, as well as the avatar, do not lose their God consciousness even for a moment although they might be engaged in all sorts of activities in relation to creation and both work through the universal mind, which is theirs during their lives on earth. Uh, Gloria, uh, could you continue for us, please? The different states of God are extremely confusing and difficult to understand since this is a subject entirely outside the scope of normal minds. We have attempted to give in the appendix a more detailed explanation of some of the principal terms relating to God. Each of the 55, no 56, God's realized men of every cycle has a circle of 12 members who belong to the circle because of their spiritual affinities in past incarnations. Each of these 12 members is made perfect by the masters concerned. That's to say, they attain to the same state of perfection as their masters, only differing in the particular duties they have to perform. As we have already stated, the 56th Sadhguru in the 11th age is the avatar of the cycle in question, and he always has has a circle is made up of 10 concentric circles of 12 disciples, disciples each. Oh, oh, you missed a line. Could you repeat? Ah, uh, sorry. Let's numbers. see. Yeah, I guess from as. Ah, sorry. As we, no have start, as we have already stated, the 56th Sadhguru in the 11th age is the avatar of the cycle in question and he always has a circle of 120 members. That is 114 men and six women. This particular circle is made up of 10 concentric circles of 12 dis disciples each. The innermost of these concentric circles has 12 members, all of them men. And each succeeding circle has a like number, but the members may be women as well as men. Each succeeding circle differs in point of beauty and importance. Although, as already understood, all the 120 members of the avataric circle are all one in self-realization. Meher Baba states that the avatar is the supreme head of the spiritual hierarchy and for that matter, of all the invisible hierarchies as well, functioning behind the scenes. At a moment's notice, these August members and the avatar can gather together at any point of the globe for conferences, whenever and wherever necessary, 
unhampered by considerations of time or space. At such August conferences, questions of far reaching importance to the world are settled far in advance of their actual occurrence. The avatar's work is never only for the immediate present, but for posterity. Before the avatar's appearance on earth, the world pattern was mapped out in the mental or creative world, later becoming externalized on the physical plane of existence. This work always being fructified for hundreds of years ahead. Scholars, particularly of the West, in the absence of any knowledge of the masters and their circles, are apt to discount Sufi and Vedanta traditions. For example, knowing nothing of the essential oneness of existence or of experience reality, capitals, they may attribute such statements as are made in this chapter to confusing the various theories of different ages instead of recognizing the universality and similarity of these ideas. That's why in the researches in comparative religion, they can sometimes be completely at variance with the subject they are writing. There are today Eastern and Western scholars who, in their ignorance of the essential truths behind all humanity, will even assert that Sufi thought in Islam is nothing but an afterthought inherited through superstition and myth. It's, it is, of course, very difficult to unravel the tangled skin of myth and folklore, but we will give an example to justify the Sufi tradition as being as old as Muhammad himself. We will take the story of the Sufi Uwayas of Quran, which confirms the original tradition of Tasawuf or Sufism. At the time of Muhammad's death, he was living a life of divine ecstasy in the desert. Two of the prophets, chief circle members, Omar and Ali, following Muhammad's instructions that after his death, they were to visit Uwais, sought out the great man in the solitudes around Mecca, and with deep reverence, carry out their master's last wishes by conveying his greetings and a request to Uwais to bless the people. During the last 1300 years, most Muslims masters have exercised great reticence regarding their work and their intimate circles. And it's not to be wondered that so little is known about the Sufi tradition, even in Eastern circles and nothing at all in Western circles. Mohammed once said, since his other name was Ahmed, I am Ahmed with an M and I am Arab without A. The word Ameh without M and Arab without A turns into the Arabic words Ahe and Rab. Both these words mean God. Let us now look at the patterns prevailing in myth and mythology to see whether there are any similarities with the traditional ideas outlined in this chapter. It is to be noted that the number 12 often appears in research on the above subjects, and it is interesting to observe that the myth mythological gods define men, they fight men, appear quite frequently to have had circles of 12, such as the Scandinavian Odin and his 12 chieftains, the Danish hero, Kroll, was always accompanied by his 12 berserks. Romulus, reputed to be man and God incarnate at the same time, had his 12 lictors. Then again, in the legend of King Arthur, there were 12 knights in his round table. There seems to have lingered I believe in the Middle Age that this master would return again. The figure 12 with the 13 as the leader of a spiritual head constantly comes up in folklore as in the ancient covens, which always consisted of 13. 
In these conclusions, those who search for comparisons in universal ideas and universal events will always find the ideas of the West and, to the, and the East to be similar. For example, it's an interesting fact that the life of Jesus follows the pattern of the culture heroes in ancient myths. The pattern is that the hero's mother is a virgin, his father often of royal descent. Then there are attempts to kill the child, who mysteriously disappears, to reappear later as king or teacher, popular for a time, then losing favor with subjects or followers and meeting with a mysterious death, often on the top of a hill. Here we have an illustration in the death of Krishna. Leaving his capital, Dwarka, on the western coast of India, Krishna came to the sea and was sitting cross-legged under a pipal tree. A huntsman, mistaking the under part of the Lord's red lotus feet for the mouth of a deer, shot an arrow at it. As he came near, he realized his mistake and um, broken heartedly prostrate himself before the Lord in his grief and adoration. Krishna told him not to distress himself and granted him the boon of his next life to be in heaven. Just then, the charioteer who was already in search of his master arrived. Instantly, Krishna's chariot, banner, and shield disappear. Later, his body vanished also on ascending into the supreme heaven. Footnote. Srimad Srimad Bhagavata, 11th Act, 31 Chapter. Th thanks, Gloria. Um, Marianne, please. Could you unmute and continue? As the description of Elijah's ascent into heaven resembles this legend, we quote 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1, quote, And it came to pass, as they still went on, and talked that, behold, there appear, appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven, end quote. Although these heroes do not always appear to have died in the ordinary sense, the body not being buried, nevertheless, they left behind them various holy sepulchers or places. Lord Raglan points out these facts in his book, The Hero. When referring to ritual drama, he finds a common basis in these different legends on the grounds that since the majority of culture heroes follow the same pattern, it is because of this similar pattern, one should deny the authenticity or historic truth of such myths. We feel on the contrary, that on these grounds, he should be all the more ready to accept and confirm them. Perhaps if he had been acquainted with the secret traditional Eastern view of the God realized men, he might have reconsidered some of his ideas, becoming aware that the universality of this pattern rather suggests that there is a basic truth behind it. Professor C. G. Jung, however, whose authority is unquestionable, emphasizes that in myths and religious symbols of different epochs and amongst different peoples, it is to be remarked that the same type of hero often appears. And the idea of an all powerful being is recognized everywhere. In fact, Dr. Jung's findings suggest a supreme universal consciousness behind all things. We now refer to the flood heroes of prehistoric antiquity. There was Osiris, a deluge hero, 
who is said to have converted the Egyptians from cannibalism and taught them agriculture and other arts. There was Botika, or Mem Terra Ketiba, said to have come from the east to the Bogota Plateau, and whose coming averted a great flood. Then again, Quetzalcoatl, the deluge survivor of the Toltecs, and also the Babylonian myth about Oanes, after whom there appeared to have been other great beings. An interesting point is that while it seemed quite possible for culture heroes to become gods, it appears to have been comparatively rare that the gods become culture heroes. Does not this suggest the avataric periods of manifestation? For the prehistoric past is thick with legends of flood heroes from different parts of the world, and we surmise. Flood heroes may have been avatars. And there's a footnote. See Flood Myths and History by Hugh Soar in the Journal of Research, Atlantis, July, 1953. With regard to the flood legends and cosmic catastrophes of the past, the calendar of the great sun temple of Kalasasaya, Kalasasaya intimates let me read that again. With regard to the flood legends and cosmic catastrophes of the past, the calendar of the great sun temple of Kala Sasaya intimates that man lived with a previous satellite in the sky. Also, according to an article by E. H. Nutter on a revised Hoer Bigger theory, Atlantis, July 1953. The strand lines of the Bolivian Altiplano form the strongest evidence in favor of moon capture and show man to have existed during the tertiary epoch in a highly civilized state. Peren. Pace scientists. Close Peren. For all we know, may not man have lived at the time of the giant reptiles of the secondary Mesozoic age? Again, in an article, Johannes G. Arnold, Atlantis, January 1953, pointed out the interesting fact that the great Saurians resemble the fantastic dragon monsters depicted in the centuries old temples of ancient Mexico and China. Also in the book of Job, there is a description of Leviathan in which the monster appears to combine the characteristics of a whale, a crocodile and a fire breathing dragon. Here, might not we have the puzzle of the origin of such pictures? For if man was a creature of the quaternary period and of the retreating ice age, then he could not have been a contemporary of the giant reptiles. Most people believe they belong to a period before man saw the light of day. But if that is so, where did the idea of giant mammals and reptiles originate. As Arnold points out, such ideas of great dragons have been at the back of folklore and mythology since time immemorial. The more widespread the investigations on early legends and mythology, the easier it is to believe in the many similar myths that man 
has lived from a far earlier age than orthodox opinion would have us believe. For why should not folk myths be evidence of a real folk memory? Arnold says that the great flood was caused by the disintegration of the tertiary satellite and therefore man must have been present as a fairly developed reasoning being. But there seem to be indications of a memory of still earlier floods. Then these race memories should reach back to the secondary period. Hence, these explanations are at least the possibility of legends regarding the fights of primitive man with these terrible dragons. For why should the Saurians have died out unless exterminated by man? Hans Horbiger, in his work, Glacial Cosmogoi, gave his, quote, moon capture, quote, theory. And he also had interesting suggestions that man coexisted with the Saurians. Hins Peter too found out the meaning of the monsters in the world flood myths originating from the Babylonian recordings of Tiamat, the dragon snake. Then again, we have the legends of less remote times. For example, the Greek legends of the bull of Minos were not believed till Sir Arthur Evans unearthed the palace of Knossos and revealed that there had been a magnificent civilization in Crete. Archeological discoveries have proved and will continue to prove that there is a hard core of fact in previously disbelieved legends. And Eger as Egerton Sykes says in his dictionary, quote, one of the disadvantages of the English system of classical education is its failure to recognize that Greek and Roman mythology, myths and traditional stories constitute the final stages of a process of historical development that stretches back into the past. This intellectual neglect on the part of scholars is the reason for so little being known regarding the myths and traditions of the Fertile Crescent and the lands bordering on the Middle Sea. Hence, the difficulty for a foundation of comparative mythology." End quote. As the oldest stories which come down to us appear to be the creation myths, the student is struck by the significant fact that the majority of these stories refer to a re-emergence of humanity after some great catastrophe, the event being so outstanding in the memory of the narrators that it suggests a kind of rebirth on the part of humanity, bringing in a new age. Sykes suggests in his introduction to the above mentioned book that the genuineness of these legends is shown by the fact that they date back to periods of time when philosophic or scientific doctrines as to the beginning of things had not yet been evolved. Since those which are of later date frequently bear the imprint of the abstract religious philosophies of the Hellenistic schools of the Middle East and should be considered as theological conceptions rather than as true myths. He also suggests that the hundreds of deluge and fire myths all belong to this earlier period and can usually be fitted into the following patterns. Quote, 
one. The tribal deity is displeased with humanity and threatens to punish them by driving them from the Elysian fields or earthly paradise. Two, there are signs and portents in the heavens, such as the changing of the course of one or more of the heavenly bodies. Three, the ancestor, man or woman, is warned of approaching disaster and advised to flee to some high mountain, to a place of refuge, or to build a ship. Four, he does so and is mocked by the wicked and impious. Five, the time of trial begins. There are cyclones and hurricanes, quantities of rocks and stones falling from above, volcanic eruptions, followed by vast fires, which are only extinguished by the heavy rains and the uprising of the waters of the great deep, which cause a flood on a vast scale. Six, the waters eventually drain away and the ancestor sets about the founding of a new race. In order to do this, he is forced to resort to incest or other desperate expedients. Many le legends tend to begin at this point, presumably because there were only a few survivors but no leader. With the deity surveying the watery waste and considering ways and means of beginning again. In the Americas, there are several stories of survivors digging themselves out of caves which have fallen in. Seven, some myths give details of the reestablishment of life and even go so far as to provide genealogical trees linking historical rulers with the great ancestors, close quote. Thank you, Marianne. Um, uh, Miguel, please. Could you unmute? In view of modern astronomical ideas that the Earth is far older than previously believed, it is not unscientific and illogical to persist in imagining that man is such a new arrival, that he is only a million years old. As Sike says, Quote, gradually by sheer force of attrition, the official scientific world is being forced to recognize that civilization is much older than any of the leading experts have been willing to credit. This reluctance is to some extent bound up with the high bound materialism of the 19th century an attitude is still to be seen in the market atheism of a recent series, series of scientific talks on the BBC, which has tied up the past, the present, and the future in a series of neatly rapid packages guaranteed to contain all the answers." End quote. And there is a footnote. Eager, Eagerton Sikes, editor of the Journal of Research Atlantis. We understand that an ice age occurs approximately, at least so it is at present believed, every two to 300,000 years. If that is so, then surely many civilizations must have come and gone about which we know nothing. As if paleontologists could possibly reconstruct, quote, the missing link out of a bit of fossilized young bone of almost immensely antiquity. And second footnote, in the 
Times of India, February 1953. Prehistoric archaeological remains were mentioned as dating back at least 250 years, 250,000 years, which had just been on Earth in the Narmada Valley near uh, Nagpur by an archaeological society from Pune University. But quite apart from ice ages, surely the constantly changing pattern of the Earth's cross due to cosmic upheavals will effectively blow out all traces of man and his past civilizations. For example, sedimentary rock covers high mountains like the Andes and the Himalayas, where seashells and skeletons of marine animals have been found on the summits, showing that these gray heights were once under the sea. There are many mountain tops all over the world where the soil gives evidence of having once been a marine bed. The mystery of the gray blocks of stone high up in the Andes has never been solved. Could it be that they might have been there before the mountains rose to their present altitudes? Geologists are unable to give any answers to many questions concerning the Earth's surface and its strata. They cannot explain why coal deposits have been found in Arctic circles, showing that huge forests must have once existed in these regions. Why did palm trees once grow at Spitsbergen? The only explanation is that giant natural catastrophes have from time to time changed the map of the world. There is every reason to suppose that the actual stability of our planet has never existed. Accordingly to Belikovsky's book, Worlds in Collision, modern research along these lines must come into conflict with the Darwinian theory of an exceedingly slow evolutionary process governing genetics. Darwin admitted his inability to explain the sudden extermination of the mammoth elephants of Alaska and Siberia. As early as 1799, the frozen bodies of these animals were found in perfect condition. The flesh so well preserved that the sledge dogs could eat it. The sudden extinction of these mammoths must have been caused in a few moments. Otherwise, why should the flesh have been so well preserved all these million million of millions of years? Also, undigested grass and leaves were found in their stomachs. Although such vegetation did not grow in that ice region for over a thousand miles away, These and other facts collected by Belikovsky helped to prove the past existence of great catastrophic upheavals. As he says, the conception of ages brought to their end by violent and sudden changes in nature is common all over the world. His work has been an exhaustive study of the history and cosmology of our planet, so far as it can be based on historical texts, classical literature, 
epics and the sacred books of the Orient and the Occident. Also primitive folklore, as well as from geological and pale paleontological material. According to him, quote, modern physics describes dramatic changes in the microcosm, the atom, the prototype of the solar system. A theory then that envisages not the similar events in the microcosm, the solar system, bringing the modern concept of physics to the celestial spheres, sphere, end quote. In his preface to his work, he has suggested that if man solves the problem of fission and fusion of the atoms, he may take our planet out of the struggle for survival among the members of the celestial sphere. Here, we venture to contest this point of view from the spiritual angle that no such complete destruction will occur because man's journey through creation is not finished and that the powers that be will always stop such an eventuality by some catastrophe designed to leave enough people to start another age. According to Sufi and Vedantic wisdom, the end of the hierarchy of avatars functioning on the air plane will synchronize with the end of the world. This will be the final dissolution of the material universe, Mahapralaya. Then follows another night of Brahman. Continue. Chapter five, Meher Baba. As already stated in the preceding chapter, the five Sadhgurus support the avatar in av avataric periods and prepare the stage in advance for his manifestation. In this age, the five masters associated with Meher Baba have already finished their work and, as the Indians say, lay down their bodies. The identity of the present five masters has not been disclosed. We will begin by describing Babajan, who was a Muslim Kutu. Her tomb is at Puna, under the Nin tree, where she insisted upon living the later part of her life. Very little is known about her beyond about her beyond the fact that she came of aristocratic lineage and was born in Afghanistan. According to the usual Eastern custom, her parents tried to force her into an unwanted marriage. How she managed to escape Purdah and make her way to a Hindu master is not known. At the age of 37, she was assisted in her higher spiritual development by a Muslim master. Returning later to her former Hindu master for the final stage, she became self-realized at the age of 65. There is a story that her constant affirmation <clears throat> that she was God and the source of everything, so enraged some Orthodox soldiery of a Buluchi regiment that they buried her alive. She used super, supernormal powers to effect her escape. And these same soldiers were astounded to find her safe. And well, many years later, 
holding court at Puna amongst her devotees. The whole regiment became her followers. This remarkable woman went on a pilgrimage to Mecca and is said to have honored the religious customs of the Muslims when in a normal conscious state, but as she was a Salik Maksub, and there is a quote, um, uh, we understand that Rabia of Basra had the same spiritual status of Baba, as Babajan. This state of self-realization on the seventh plane of consciousness is very, very rare in women. When a soul has reached the end of its journey through creation and is about to achieve union with the other soul, it almost always takes on the male form for its final initiation into self-realization. Uh, but as she was a Salik Maksu, that may not have been very often. That may not have been very often. There are many amazing stories about her, as there are of all masters. But we are only concerned with her relation, relationship to Meher Baba. The boy Merwan, Meher Baba, met Baba Jan one day in 1913, at the age of 19, when he was a Puna College boy. Fascinated, he would visit the old lady. Then came the momentous meeting which transformed the boy's consciousness. And for seven years, he remained in a somewhat mass-like condition for Baba Jan gave him, gave him God realization, but did not give him back his normal consciousness. <clears throat> we will now quote in detail from The Perfect Master by C.B. Purdom, which book gives a very detailed account of the earlier part of the life of Meher Baba. Uh, quote, one night in January 1914, when Merwan, whose name was shortened to Meher, made his usual visit, Babajan was in a mood to talk. He kissed her hands and stood humbly before her. She pointed her little finger at him and declared that, quote, this child of mine will after some years create a great sensation in the world and do immense good to humanity, end quote. Meha remained standing before her for a few minutes and then went home. It was nearly 11 o'clock at night. He at once went to bed. Before 10 minutes had passed, he began to experience extraordinary thrills. He felt as if he were receiving electric shocks and as if his nerves were mere vibrations. He felt great joy mingled with pain. And presently he became alarmed, but his alarm was short-lived for he became unconscious. Uh, and, thanks, Miguel. Uh, um, uh, Gloria, please. <clears throat> the first person to discover Meher in this condition was his mother. She found him laying with open vacant eyes. She called to him, and he sat up. He couldn't speak, 
Thinking he was seriously ill, she made him lie down again. For three days, he lay in his condition. His eyes were open, but he saw nothing. On the fourth day, Mare began to move about and was slightly conscious of his body. So he remained for nearly nine months. He had no knowledge of his own actions and what he did was in response to non-prompting prompting of his mind. He was totally unconscious of the world. If he seated himself, he would not get up until the lapse of several hours. If he woke, he would continue walking for a number of hours. One day, he said to have left his home in the hot sun during the afternoon and to have walked for 15 miles without stopping, in the course of which he went from his home to the bone garden and back three times. Once he went to Pongua, behind the Parsi Tower of Silence at Puna, and there lay down for three days. He had no food, he did not sleep. His parents thought his mind to be unhindered, unhinged. He was given food, but he gave it to the dogs or intended to give it away to beggars, put it in his drawers where it went rotten and stunk, end quote. Quote, he was placed under medical treatment, given sleeping drugs and morphia injections, but nothing had any effect. He was sent to Bombay to see if a change of environment would make any difference, but he remained the same. He stayed with his brother, James Hethe, in Bombay for two months and used to go to Chopati in the mornings, sitting there for hours, watching the waves. And in the afternoons, he would go to the Victoria Gardens, sitting always on one particular bench. Then, he returned to Pune, spending most of his time in the garret of his father's house." End quote. In November 1914, he regained a little consciousness and behaved, it was said, quote, behave, it was said, as an automata possessing intuition, end quote. His eyes ceased to be vacant and life returned to them. He began to take food regularly, though in small amounts. He mixed little with the members of his family and seldom went out walks. A month after this partial return to consciousness, his friend Kodata Shurstad Irani brought, brought to him a poor young man of her Persian parentage named Behramji, Ferdunji Irani, <clears throat> who immediately became attached to him and afterwards, afterwards was one of his most intimate disciples. Meher offered to teach Behramji Persian, which was the first sign of his having regained consciousness. His parents were delighted and urged him to get regular work with the object of aiding his recovery. And when he refused, they got additional pupils for him, but he declined to accept them. But he taught Rajamti, who made rapid progress, though Meher himself was said to possess no more than a tenth of his normal consciousness. He taught automatically, not as a conscious teacher, End quote. Second, the spiritual master. At last, there came a further development. During April 1915, Meher had an impulse to lead an itinerant, itinerant life. At first, he wandered only in the suburbs of Pune, but as the impulse grew upon him, he decided to go further afield. So one day he informed Bajrami that he would shortly go to a distant place and there lead the life of a monk under the guidance of a Sadhguru. He told Bajramji that after settling there, he would invite him to join him and that he, Bajramji, would do well to accept the invitation. On the same day, he left Pune by train but to everybody's surprise returned the next day. He had intended to go to Raichur, but had gone 
34 miles from Pune, he decided to get out. About seven miles away from Kejaun station, there lived Sadhguru Narayan Maharaj, whom Meher had imposed to meet. Meher therefore called upon him, and after a brief stay, returned to his home at Pune. End quote. Quote, Sadhguru Narayan Maharaj lives in a large, well-furnished bungalow. He wears costly clothes and adorns his person with jewels. He's a strict vegetarian and eats very little. He plays the role of a great bhakta and offers prayers and performs ceremonies regularly. His pilgrims number thousands and he has built a large inn to accommodate them. He has also built a beautiful temple in honor of the Hindu god Datta into which he goes twice a day. Though his mode of living is that of a rich man, he's regarded as, quote, God realized. He said to have became, become an itinerant monk as a child and to have become spiritually perfect at the age of 25. And thanks, uh, thanks, Gloria. Uh, Marianne, could you uh, read for us, please? Okay. After a fortnight in Pune, Mayer, accompanied by Beramji, left again and went to Bombay, where he remained for a few days. The only person he saw in Bombay was Tipu Baba, who stayed at the time near a mosque at Bendi Bazaar, which is one of the most crowded localities of the city. Tepu Baba, a disciple of Harzat Abdurrahman, is a saint, but not a perfect one. From Bombay, Meher went to Aurangabad. At that time, Benemyan Baba was staying in that city. He was a Majub, that is, a God-realized man who remains unconscious of the gross world. He was a disciple of Sai Baba of Sherdi. Continuing the quote, after visiting Benemyan Baba, Mayer went with Baramji to Nagpur, where both of them paid a visit to Tajuddin Baba, about whom Baba John used to say, Taj is Khalifa, meaning Taj is head of the Caliphs. Tajuddin Baba was a great Mohammedan Hazrat. He was once a soldier in the service of the British government when he became God realized. Then he gave up the military calling and went to Nagpur. As soon as it was known that Tajuddin had become spiritually perfect, Persons of all castes and creeds called upon him with a view to getting his blessing. There seemed to be no limit to the number of his visitors. People troubled him by asking him silly questions and by entreating him to fulfill their desires. He was indeed much annoyed with them and the annoyance became so unbearable that he desired to get away from all visitors. He carried out this resolution in the following manner. One evening, he went naked to a tennis court where Europeans were playing and began to behave exactly like a madman. As a consequence, he was sent to a lunatic asylum where he lived for 17 years. Even there, hundreds of people called upon him with a view to receiving his blessing. In the last year of his life, in the lunatic asylum, the titular chief of Kamti near Nagpur paid him a visit. The chief was well aware of the fact that Tajuddin Baba was a sadguru and as sane as himself. He persuaded the saint to leave the asylum and stay as his guest at his palace in Nagpur, where he would not be troubled by worldly people. 
the Hazrat accepted the invitation and passed the remainder of his life when already well stricken in age in the chief's palace. He is reputed to have performed a number of miracles, one of which was to make a dead man alive. He breathed his last in 1924. At his funeral, no less than 30,000 people were said to have been present. From Nagpur, Meher returned to Pune. After some weeks, he again left in company with the same friend to call upon Hazrat Sai Baba of Sherdi, of whom something should be said when and where Sai Baba was born. Who were, and there's a footnote, Puran, it has been said by Meher Baba that Sai Baba had the spiritual direction of the First World War. He is greatly revered throughout India and was noted for speaking very little. So when and where Sai Baba was born, who were his parents, how he passed his boyhood days are not known. His career can be traced from his arrival at Sherdi, which is a village at a distance of 10 miles from the Kapargaon railway station in the district of Ahmed Abinagar in the Deccan. About 60 years ago, he first went to this village and in the beginning led the life of an itinerant monk. He begged not only for food, but also for oil. For in the mosque of the village, he kept a lamp burning all night. One day, those who generally used to give him oil resolved not to give him any. So in the presence of several people, he filled the lamp with water, and to their astonishment, it began to burn when he lighted it, and it burned all night. This miracle, which I repeat has told me, naturally convinced the people that he was not an ordinary fakir, but a great saint. Thenceforth, the whole village were his devotees, and he began to live in the mosque itself. When calm, he was as gentle as a lamb, but when roused up, he was liable to be exceedingly fierce. As the years rolled by, the number of his devotees went on increasing. From his rich visitors, he asked for money and there and then gave it away to the poor standing near. Thousands of his devotees were Hindus and though he was a Mohammedan, they performed the ceremony of Arti in his honor, is a footnote. Quote, Arti is an act of devotion in which the devotees stand facing the master. One of them holds a metal tray on which there are flowers, ember sticks, camphor, which is ignited. The tray is waved before the master while the devotees chant a hymn. Let's see. His greatest and most famous disciple was no other than Upasni Maharaj, who is a Hindu. It was in 1918 that he finally entered Samadhi, or as we say, died. A stone slab in the mosque used to serve him as a pillow. One day in that year, it was accidentally broken to pieces. Sai Baba, seeing the pieces, said that the breaking of the slab meant that it was to be the last day of his life, and it proved to be so. After beholding the white head of Sai Baba, Meher with Baramji turned his footsteps to the residence of Sadhguru Upasni Maharaj, who, as will be seen later, was destined to bring him to full consciousness after six long years, 
It was then the last month of the year, 1915. Thanks, Marion. Um, so we'll continue from here uh, next week and uh, let's just check the page. Halfway through page 96. Okay.